everybody. Welcome to the Deep In Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Tom Trowbridge. Thrilled to have Trevor here from Render. Trevor is on the board of the Render Foundation. Render is one of the old school, pro- you know, projects, kind of the core Deep In projects that was Deep In before Deep In existed. So um, thrilled to have Trevor here. Trevor, welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. You know, I think this is a, um, you know, most people here, it's going to, if you've never heard of Render, you're probably, as a joke, on the wrong podcast. But but for those who don't, could you give um, a little bit of a, of a background and description of what, of what Render is doing? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, so Render Network is a distributed GPU network that was founded by creators for creators. And the, the initial problem we tried to solve was to deliver fast, affordable movie quality rendering at scale to really democratize it for the consumer. And, um, you know, as a second use case has emerged for the GPU, um, at least commercially in AI, um, it's become much more than just um, a render provider. And and now these GPUs are are used to provide rendering and AI jobs um, for creators uh, across the world. And can you explain for people that aren't as familiar with this space what rendering is for those that are not as familiar with it? Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, um, same, yeah, similar to you not being a, uh, a motion graphics artist, it was pretty foreign to me when I came on board. So, um, the creation of, of an animation is a pretty complex workflow from start to finish. Uh, it, it starts with creating a, a 3D model. Um, you know, if the best way to describe that is if you've seen your kid, um, build something in Roblox or, or Minecraft, you know, they construct a model piece by piece until you have a, a scene. And then the, the process of rendering is converting that model into pixels. And, um, you know, the output is typically a photo or a series of photos or frames that become a, a video. But it, it's really the step where it goes from um, just looking like a, a computer model to something that is photorealistic and, um, you know, um, really um, conveys the vision of the artist that created it. And so the GPU compute is used to to create and refine those images right and that that's a compute yeah. heavy task fair right? yeah yeah so it, rendering historically uh, go back 20 years ago was all done on the cpu um and you know otoy's founder jules Erbach, was one of the original pioneers in pushing uh, to move it from the cpu to the gpu um that push turned out to be um, very savvy. It's, it's over 40 times uh, faster on a GPU than a CPU, really because you can do things in, in parallel as opposed to in series. Um, but yes, the, the whole process takes a mountain of compute. And what, what's been really interesting is, uh, you know, it seeded a, a whole uh, first commercial use case for the GPU and, and an industry. Um, you know, NVIDIA 20 years ago was, was nothing like the behemoth it is today. And a lot of that is is on the back of, of you know, rendering at the start and then other use cases emerging. Um, as you know, we've seen steps in, in GPU power over the years and, and really kept up with Moore's law. Um, you, you know, we thought it would be faster and faster, but on the flip side, on, on the the actual usage side, we, we've gone from you know grainy images to better images to video to you know, 4K video, and now are on the cusp of moving to 3D. And with each of those, there's an exponential jump in compute needs. So it's kind of been a, an interesting, um, you know, uh, just endeavor in seeing compute get better and better and better, but then at the same time, seeing the need for compute only grow. And when I'm describing it there, I'm only describing the rendering side. When you think about the AI side, that compute need is, is as big, perhaps even larger. Um, so that the GPU has become a, a central resource to the world and, you know, it has put some companies as the most valued companies in the world really on the back of, of being GPU producers. Well, what, what I think is, you know, correct me if this characterization is, is fair or not, but there are a variety of deep in networks. If you take a really high level view that create supply and then are looking for a particular um, demand. But you've actually started with a very specific, not started, but you are fulfilling a very specific demand in terms of video rendering. And it's a huge market. Help people understand how big that market is. But I think yeah. that's interesting because it's a much more 
what's interesting is how specific that is and how big it is versus a lot of deep pins, which are much broader and struggle right. or, or, or more challenged in finding the, the, the demand side. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you, you know, it really started out of our own need on, on the Otoy side. Um, you, you know, we are artists. And, and back up, we, can, you, can you explain yeah. Otoy to people? Because I don't yeah, think sure. you've introduced that yet. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Not a problem. So um, Otoy is a 3D animation software company. Um, the flagship product of, of Otoy is Octane Render. It's the market-leading consumer GPU renderer. Um, and uh, Otoy and Jules Urbach were the original founders of the render network. Um, the, the network has evolved significantly since then. Um, there's now a foundation that assumed stewardship of the network and Otoy is a, a core contributor. Um, but, you know, really importantly from an Otoy perspective, they, they came from a need of, of producing this GPU software and selling it to their customers and, and seeing customers were struggling with time and affordability. You know, typically you, you would, you know, press enter on a render and, and go and, you know, have a cup of coffee, perhaps come back overnight to see what you'd rendered. It just wasn't feasible in uh, a workflow. Um, and, and so, um, you know, particularly as these scenes kept becoming more complex and as resolutions kept becoming better uh, in the rendering industry, you always had a, a core problem of, of needing to, to have faster rendering that, uh, you know, didn't go away and, and really was the core thesis for this project. Um, it, it, you know, the prior to this, Otoy had tried to scale on the enterprise side um, and had you know, large deals with the, the large hyperscalers, but really struggled um, commercially. And uh, the Render Network's premise was um, to leverage a market opportunity of, of millions of idle consumer GPUs um, to allow this project to, to really um, tackle the problem in a different way from, you know, a centralized company that goes out and, and buys a stack of hardware, has a, a cost of capital associated with it, prepares their, their own data center, and then tries to monetize it. So it, it really was twofold. It, it was an innovative um, approach to a, um, a real customer need, and then second, leveraging a, a real gap in the market in consumer GPUs and then being more prevalent than on the enterprise side. So many different places. I, I'm curious to go with that, but um, mm. it, it sounds like it started with a particular use case. And you yeah. was it a cost? Was it cost which really drove that decision to try to drive to a decentralized solution as opposed yeah. to a hyperscaler? So, so cost and speed, and, and they're kind of a function of each other. You know, if you were a motion graphics artist and trying to do this on your, your home rig, what you either had to do was go out and buy a lot of hardware right, to be able to do it in an efficient time at home, or you were somewhat stumped. So cost on that front, um, but also on the speed front, being able to do this in, in parallel across GPUs all over the world um, significantly changed the game at, you know, you being able to do complex scenes in, in just seconds or, or minutes as opposed to, you know, in serial on your, your home rig. Um, so a combination of both, but really it, it's been the core premise of the network is to help try and solve those needs for artists. And versus home rig, but what about versus hyperscaler cloud? How do you think about those yeah. two? Because that was that seems to be the yeah. other alternative to doing it yourself. Yeah, so on the hyperscaler side, particularly when we started this, um, and, and this is true today, um, the biggest challenge is availability. Um, you know, we have a GPU shortage on the high end. Um, when you get access to high end GPUs as a, a cloud provider, typically, um, you know, they're reserved instances. And, uh, you know, as a small motion graphics artist, being able to find scalable, um, dependable compute at one of these hyperscalers was, was not simple and definitely um, could only be done at a premium given the other demand for, for these rigs. Fascinating. Okay. So it was just difficult as, as because of fragmented industry, you were not able, the individual users weren't able to basically right. command the, the market, um, you know, presence to, to have dedicated resources. Yeah. And so you right. guys then both were able to aggregate the demand and also aggregate supply to be yeah. in the middle of that. Right. Yeah. What, what I'd add is that there's a technical element too. You know, if you need to go to um, one of the hyperscalers, you, you would have to provision 
your own instance, you would have to install a, a set of software uh, associated with that, um, be on the hook for doing it correctly and running it. Um, and, and in many ways, that's more of a um, somebody who, who is technical as opposed to a motion graphics artist who really has a, a render file that they want rendered as opposed to having to learn how to, to set something up with a hyperscaler and, and really get to the infrastructure side. So in, in many ways, like um, companies like Heroku and, and others helped um, deliver platforms as a service. This is really a, a platform as a service um, and software as a service play because you, you really don't have to think about the infrastructure as the motion graphics artist. You you upload your file and the network does all the heavy lifting for you, um, chops it up between various nodes across the world and delivers it back to you in a software workflow where you get to approve it um, prior to the uh, node operator being paid. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, it, it is very different from just renting an instance. And, and I think um, that service element is absolutely critical to the success or the early stage success of the network. Super interesting. And, and I think then considering that a little bit further, um, is the use case a, lot, a, a long tail of lots of individual, um, you know, artists, or is it, or you moved because, because it yeah. sounds like you, you can start off with the demands with, with the, the, the sort of supply side being lots of individuals that may change over time to be more yes, yeah. corporate GPU yeah. and, and the demand side yeah. individual long tail that moves to more corporate as well. How did, I'm curious on those transitions. Yeah, yeah pre pretty much both. And, and at various stages, you know, you, you have a, a two sided marketplace here. And so scaling the two sided marketplace is, is exceptionally challenging. And where we started with, was a simple motion graphics artist workflow. But as we evolved on the, the, the usage side, um, you know, we added an API and we have apps today that use the network behavior pattern from individual motion graphics artists. And beyond that, um, there are larger studios who um, we're talking to, to evolve usage in, in a different way, higher and higher up that enterprise chain from where we originated. But I mean, our, our core bread and butter was that individual motion graphics artist who had a high-end card. And that was really important to us because those are the first nodes that we allowed onto the network. Um, you, you know, we really focused on essentially an end-to-end -end platform, if you like, a battery for a motion graphics artist who, instead of, um, you know, having to um, actually go out and, and buy more hardware, were able to put their individual hardware on the network to earn render tokens and then use those render tokens for their actual render jobs. Um, it, you know, it, oh, it was very much an, an end-to-end -end ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. And really you chat to motion graphics artists who, who were amazed that they were able to um, essentially um, supplement the cost of their business um, by being able to earn render and, and then use it for um, their NFTs or, or their animations or their art. It, it's, it's an absolutely amazing, well thought out process and, and great credit to the guys who founded it. Super interesting. So just so I can re see if I replay that back, you're, remote, you're an artist, you have a high end machine. Yep. That high-end machine can contribute to the network, but that machine, while it could render your graphics, would take a long time, wouldn't be fast, et cetera. So you yep. actually earn by contributing to the network. And then when you use the network, you're using everybody else's machines and you're making and you're rendering your own content much faster than exactly. if you had tried to join your own machine. Exactly. So it's self-perpetuating. Just by you joining, you, you get enough in, in the wallet in terms of earnings to then go out and, and utilize it and therefore get your work faster. And that commercially helps in, in a, a variety of ways in terms of speed of delivery, in terms of, of you know, cost. So, um, you, you know, it's been a, um, really a, a passionate group of creators who jumped in. Now, as things have evolved and as the, the scale has evolved, we've had to bring on higher levels of compute. Uh, and particularly um, more recently, our community has, has pushed us towards leaning into the AI opportunity. Um, and, and when we did that, um, you, you know, it was really interesting for us. We, we've always known, um, you know, that AI would be a critical part of the artist workflow. And on the Otoy level and, and other provider levels, um, we're seeing AI integrated into the workflows in a way that is part of the render job. 
So AI has always been part of that vision. Um, but over and above that, you know, because we have access to such a large network of idle GPUs, uh, the community really wanted to harness uh, some of the more traditional um, instance type modeling or, or, or other type of, uh, types of services. So, um, you know, they voted for us to um, open up our APIs and, and to attract a couple of compute providers. And our, our initial six compute providers are, are many of the well-known deep-in um, compute providers that I think many of you know of. And, um, you, you know, for us, it, it's been really exciting to watch these um, projects emerge, uh, to see them have different approaches to orchestration and to, to target market, and to, to bring those to the render network GPUs in, in a variety of different ways. Um, so, you know, with that switch and with us doing um, a combination of uh, not only rendering jobs, but also AI jobs, the, the makeup of the network is shifting and we're seeing a, a real need for um, ASICs or, or higher end GPU devices that before weren't necessarily as needed. I think if I step back and, and you, you look at the, the GPU, um, many modern GPUs the last five years or so contain ray tracing hardware on them. And that ray tracing hardware is really geared towards making uh, the rendering process faster. It's a, a graphic element of it. And, and those cards are ideally suited to doing rendering. Um, however, they're, they're not necessarily ideally suited towards doing AI training. And they're, they're better rigs and setups as you move towards certain AI jobs that, uh, that make sense for us to bring them onto the network to help, you know, service those compute clients. And, and also, you know, as things evolve on the, um, AI and rendering combined workflow to service elements of those within the workflow. Well, I'd love to talk about AI, but I first want to tick off rendering. And so yeah, sure. on, on rendering, what, what I also find, I mean, help us understand how big the market yeah. is for this. And, and what I find also interesting is you started this, I'm guessing, or, or um, you know, you, you, Otoy started Render because of its need, not because, mm -hmm. hey, we're going to target this big market because we think X, Y, or Z. Right. It's more like we have a need. We think we can architect a way to solve it. And we go from there. And I haven't seen any project that started that way. It goes the other way where projects usually come up with a deep in, um, you know, uh, protocol and then start a first use case of that protocol, right? You guys kind of yeah. almost did the reverse, which I haven't heard of anybody yeah. else doing. Well, you know, um, so the rendering market is massive. Pretty much everything you watch on the internet, if it is a video content that isn't self-generated content, has some form of post-production and some form of rendering attached to it. Um, a, a scale I like to give is, is in 2021, uh, three quarters of a billion dollars of NFTs were created using Otoy's Octane Render software. Um, now, not all of those were on the render network, um, and I'll, I'll talk about why we don't know that in a second, but it, it just gives you an idea of, of the absolute scale um, of just one segment of the market in NFTs. Uh, rendering has so many different use cases, starting from animations to um, real um, VFX to products to um, architecture, you know, really across the board. Uh, rendering is, is a, a process that really touches um, very much everything we see and do uh, without us understanding or realizing it. So it, it is a massive, massive market. What what we try and do every year is actually produce a, a showreel of what was created on the network. Um, and why for us that's a challenge is we're dealing with motion graphics artists who are, are producing work for, for paid um, return. And so for them, security is critical. You know, um, making sure that when you have a distributed system doing the render, they don't have access to whatever is being rendered is absolutely fundamental. And so this is, is how we've constructed the network. And because we've done that, you, you know, this is pretty normal. If you're a Hollywood movie, you don't want elements of it leaking out, you know, a year before the, the movie happens. So, um, you know, it's a core tenant of our target market, our creators. And so that, you know, we don't know what is created on the render network ourselves. We, we need to be told what was created. We, we can see jobs running, um, but y you know, the whole premise is, is one of um, really protecting uh, that artist group. 
and and so you know every year we do this show reel last year's show reel i showed off at, at breakpoint had, had an amazing run of different things created you know uh emmy winning I- intros and, and endings to to movies and, and tv series um you know nasa used them <laughs> in some of the distributions uh award-winning games um you, you know it is really staggering how broad the usage is and uh you know i'm sure uh, at some point this year, we'll be putting one of those together again and trying to help publicize some of the amazing creations that are created every day by folks using this network. Help help understand the other metrics you use. Is it hours of video rendered? Is it a number of yeah. individual um, artists that are using it? Is it revenue? You yeah. mentioned that seven hundred, you know, three quarters of whatever of um, a billion in a T-shirt. Help, yeah. Me. But- yeah, help understand kind yeah. of for someone that doesn't know metrics yeah. here. So for for us now, uh, the foundation's north star is, is work done on chain, and uh, the way you pay for a render job is in fiat, right? And what you are purchasing is a relative measure of octane bench. Octane bench is a um, benchmark um, that essentially levels the computing power of a GPU. So a benchmark 1490 um, card would render the scene in an hour. Um, therefore, on a different card, it would render it in two hours or in 30 minutes, right? And using that benchmark, we are then able to allocate um, and uh, have the user pay for a job based on essentially energy consumption. Right, and so um, for us, the the octane bench um, avail network is is a key metric, as well as the um, essentially the the revenue or the the power purchased over a period is a, a key metric. Um, beyond that, we we do track number of scenes uploaded, number of frames processed, but in, in many ways those are rough metrics because um, one frame or, or one scene isn't necessarily equal to another. We have some extremely small scenes and some extremely complex scenes and same with frames. Um, so we, we have a, a number of relative measures, but for, for us, it, it's really usage. How, how much uh, you know, work has the network done? And what's great about our model is that is all on chain. You know, uh, we, we have a, you know, we can go into that in some depth if you want, but we have a, a burn mint model where um, the fiat used by, um, received by artist is converted into render and burnt. Um, so, you know, for us, that is the core metric of, of usage and, and growth and, and one we track very carefully. Yeah, we might as well talk about that, that model for sure. I want to get into your background, but let's, and, and, and link with everything, but let's, let's continue on, on this topic. But, but one, one question first, what about number of art of either, um, GPUs on the network or number of, of artists using it help? Is it yeah. no sense of scale so- as to that? Yeah. So, so, I mean, it's such a challenge because, because one artist could be thousands of X, the volume of another artist, right? Um, and particularly when you talk the more enterprise type use cases, you know, the folks who, who through an app use our product have a very different usage pattern. Um, there are, are tons of smaller jobs, right? Um, as opposed to sort of more intricate scenes. Um, on the, the number of nodes side, um, what what's amazing is is there's an abundance of consumer GPUs, idle consumer GPUs. So we have a, a wait list on the rendering side um, that uh, you know we haven't opened up as we scale artist usage. You know we're um, very excited by the current growth and hopeful that in the not too distant future we can onboard more nodes onto the rendering front. But for the moment now. Um, we, we have enough to justify the, the volumes on the network and you don't want to have folks joining the network and not making any money. So, uh, you know, the idea of, of restricting it and, and scaling it at the same time is, is really important to us. But what, what we've done for folks who, who can't access that now is we've opened up, um, nodes for AI jobs and, and those are, are open at the moment and, um, they're slightly different economics, but, um, you know, really important to try and find use cases for idle GPUs. So short answer, number of nodes is is something we track, but less so it's it's really volume of work on the network. And are we getting to a point where um, folks aren't able to get a job fast or 
um, yeah, uh, in an affordable manner. And, and at that point, we'll, you know, um, onboard more folks onto the network or, um, you yeah, know, make plans around that. You know, that, that certainly makes sense. I mean, that's something that we were picking, spending a lot of time on at Fluence as well. And our model is a little bit different in that we compensate CPUs when they join the network for just adding capacity and for, um, for, for that capacity on the network. But we are going to scale quite deliberately in line with use on the network as well for similar reasons. Yeah. And so you kind of always want to have excess capacity, but not too much excess capacity and, and scale exactly. in line with, 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 with customer demand. So fully, fully understand that, that model. Well, um, and you, you'd mentioned the, the token side of it and, and the burn and, and mint. And so it's interesting also that it sounds like the model is that, um, people pay for the jobs in fiat, but that then goes translated into the render token, which then burns to some extent. So I'd love to hear how the reward compensation works. Yeah. Yeah. So the community last year voted on us um, changing our model and moving to this new burn mint um, equilibrium model. You, you know, for um, when I look back at the proposal and, and what was driving um, their desire here, I think there were a number of fronts. They, they wanted um, artists to have simple pricing. And so costing in, in fiat made a ton of sense, right? In many ways, it, it's a crypto onboarding because folks who are motion graphics artists aren't necessarily uh, involved in crypto or, or you know, potentially don't even want to be involved in crypto. And in many, in many cases, they don't have to be. You know, they come to the Rando network, they pay fiat, they get their job back, um, and in no way actually ever touch crypto. Um, but, you know, if you're successful in uploading that job and um, you have the ability to add your node like many folks did, um, you, you then need a crypto wallet and there's a means of, of understanding uh, crypto um, in a bite-sized onboarding process that's worked really well for a number of these creators. It's pushed them into the ecosystem, pushed them into NFTs and more, and, and it's been uh, amazing for them. Um, so, so yeah, artists pay in fiat and then um, that fiat is used to purchase uh, render on through a smart contract on a decentralized basis and that render is burned. Um, so there, there is a separation between um, the flow in and the flow out to nodes. Um, nodes are paid via a um, fixed emission schedule uh, that's been set for uh, the next 25 years. Um, and, uh, you know, it is really a relative percentage of the work done going to each node. Um, you know, they get a percentage of that period or that epoch's emissions. And, and why the, the model was interesting to the community is this separation model with uh, separation between the, the burning and the emissions meant that um, the community could decide to allocate um, an element of the emissions beyond just to node operators. And so, um, you know, a great example of this is the community also voted for us to move from Ethereum to Solana. And um, one of the things the the uh, proposal facilitated was a, a pool of emissions or, or rewards for folks who, who manually went out and did that upgrade and, and moved from Ethereum to Solana. So, uh, you, you know, it's not what, what the emissions part led to was um, being able to reward folks across the ecosystem as needs emerged and as we scaled up and down. Um, that um, migration or, or upgrade, sorry, is um, is something that is towards its tail end at the moment. And what we're seeing uh, instead is an allocation of um, emissions to artists. Um, and that that's amazing because that's really helping us um, do things like promotions or referral programs or competitions or more to help drive actual additional usage of the network. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's great to have the ability to apply emissions to where um, they're most needed within the ecosystem. And it's something that our community votes on um, regularly. They voted on most recently a couple of months back to rebalance those in different directions, um, ready with a view towards uh, making sure that the um, emissions are, are helping grow the project in a way that uh, helps everyone in the community. And does that lead to um, um, providers, artists 
charging less than a market price potentially for their GPU because they're also compensating render tokens. And so if you're bullish on the protocol, yeah. wouldn't you want to give away your compute in order to, to take a larger share of those render tokens because you're doing more of the compute on the network? So, so your, um, your question there assumes they're getting paid for um, fiat for their usage and, and they're not. Um, the, the nodes are only oh, being paid five, five, emissions. Five. In yeah. only emissions. Fair enough. Okay, fine. So, and yeah. the emissions that I, I, I get it. Okay. So, and then, so yeah. the point is, okay. So they're just being paid by emissions and the revenue, the, yeah. the revenue goes to the network. The network burns the tokens. The network emits Correct. the proportionately Correct. based on the amount you're doing. Correct. Correct. It, it's so how's pricing? Really how's model. pricing? Yeah. So the pricing how's isn't pricing good. Set? It's pri pricing no, but, is, is sig yeah, significantly lower than, um, than the hyperscalers, if you to go then go to them for render costs. But sorry, do individual providers set that pricing, or does the network set no. that pricing? No, no, the network sets that pricing. The network gotcha. sets that okay. pricing. The individual providers are compensated um, independently of this in in emissions as a relative percentage of work done. So, so say in a, a given epoch, you know, you you did ten hours of of the total. 1,000 hours worked, you're, you're going to get 10 over 1,000 of the total emissions yep. for the epoch. It, it's totally. in no way fiat-related or fiat-driven, which which is a model I've seen in many places on some of the other deep in infrastructure providers. But for us, um, I think the, the genesis of this was really from from Helium. And uh, Yeah, listen. You know, yeah. No, it, make, it, make, it makes sense. It's so funny. I mean, it's just we've gone the other way at Fluence where you're paid in tokens, but with a dollar base at $10 per core per month is kind of a baseline for prov proving capacity as CPUs, not GPUs. And then yep. if you take, if you actually get useful compute, you're the one that's setting the pricing for that and you get paid yep. in your stable coin for that. And that turns off the reward, the Fluence rewards. And so we think that leads to different pricing levels because some people will not want the six month vesting on the fluence reward. So they're going to be more akin. They'll be more interested in getting fiat immediately. Others will be more interested in, in the fluence tokens and set pricing to be higher. Right. So we think it leads to a variety yeah. of pricing. The network is sort of out of it in that way, but is, is there, yeah. there are a lot of all these models can work. It's just a different, different setup. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when, when we look at the use case we have, which is artists who, who are looking to do commercial rendering, for, for them, having a um, fixed, understandable price is really important. There's a, a calculator on the, the Render Network site where they're, they're able to upload you know, uh, or calculate um, a, a rough estimate of what it will cost them because this is so important in a commercial type undertaking um, as opposed to you renting an instance uh, where you know it, it's more a function of, of how long you need it and um, a, a cost element that's that's really time based as opposed to job based. Fair enough, super interesting. Well, let's um, um, back up for a second and talk about Trevor. Yeah. How did you? How did you? Yeah. You joined you know three or four years yeah, ago. Sure. How did you? Yeah. Your background is super relevant to this. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I. Prior to this, I was CEO of a, a SaaS uh, Web2 company called Yola. They're a, a drag and drop website builder. Um, it, you know, one of the original, um, you know, Web2 creator platforms, you know, that, that made, uh, made it significantly easier to create a website ready in a, a PowerPoint drag and drop type way. Uh, and a, as I was exiting there, um, you know, I was connected with Jules and team and, and from an Octane side, I, I was really interested in um, it, it being a similar SaaS product. And, and a lot of what I'd learned um, yeah, in my tenure in running a large SaaS company was really relevant to, I, I think, what could help on the Octane front. So I, I came on board really with that focus. But uh, you know, as I came on board, I, I got to learn and understand the render network. Um, and I was absolutely enamored from the start at the um, just how eloquently it was constructed for creators, that um, how passionately this creators market followed and, and used it. And, and many of those um, really um, mirror what you look for in a Web2 product. 
you know, uh, net promoter score and, um, you know, those types of measures are really critical to being able to scale a product. So as I, I looked into it, I, I was really buoyed by by that aspect of um, the render network and, and what it could become on the back of that. And so, uh, you know, I was hooked. I suddenly found myself doing more and more on the render front. And um, it, it's been a, a really exciting education as I learned crypto, as I learned um decentralized compute as I learned rendering to, to really put these pieces together. Um, the, the model um, from an OTOI perspective for the, the render network is, is really interesting too, because it's, it's a usage based SaaS model. And, um, it, you know, when I look at the progression, most SaaS models that I've been involved with prior were monthly license fees. To, to me, the exciting piece is probably the, the largest private company in the world is, is Stripe. And their model is a similar usage-based model. So, you know, I, SpaceX I might like, be well, bigger. You know, interesting. Huh? True, true. S true. SpaceX could be, maybe could well be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll call them one of the largest then. Fair. But, um, you, you know, for me, the the model aspect was really interesting, and and I think one that um, really can scale on the back of of a massive need for rendering and a massive need for AI. Um. One thing that I, I observe in deep in projects, I think this is true for, for you guys as well, is that it takes a confluence of a variety of factors to make the timing of this work. And you, it sounds like for the render network, the critical development was the, the, the breadth or sorry, the availability and scale of hardware distributed around creators that was sufficient to add to this network. There's that. And then there's the software capability of you guys being able yeah. to to stitch together in a platform, you know, all the yeah. jobs and make them actually work. But without the graphics cards being widely distributed and accessible, this wouldn't work, yeah. right? So it, Render couldn't have operated before that happened, right? Yeah, it, to me, it, it goes back to Joseph's original hypothesis that the GPU was was better for rendering. And, and as that played out into uh, cloud and, and then distributed cloud, this is where the opportunities emerged. You, you know, one of the, the areas that I think isn't talked about enough um, when you, you think about this project is you always get the question, you know, but why blockchain? You know, does it, does it really need the blockchain for this? And if you look back at, at some of Jules's essays, um, you know, one of his essays back in 2017, I think is still very relevant. Um, it, there, there was an element to this where he believed um, we were going to move into um, some of the issues we're coming up with now where creation is a lot easier through AI um, and, you know, a, a proliferation um, of uh, content being generated in ways that just couldn't be done before. And, and for him, the, the premise of creation was absolutely critical. And so um, being able to prove creation by showing on the blockchain that you had actually rendered the work, that you had created it. For, for him and for us is, is really a central premise of where we want to take the render network. Um, so provenance is probably one of the core tenants for, for why the render network um, uses blockchain and, and why it was founded. And I think you'll, you'll see as the project evolves a lot more on that because I think a lot plays into provenance and, and um, how your data is used for training and more that sits very nicely um, using blockchain technology. Um, super interesting. And you, you mentioned AI. Let's talk about AI for a second. Sounds like mm -hmm. you can scale some, you, you mentioned GPUs that aren't used for rendering at the moment can be deployed for, potentially for clusters, training models. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that and the complexities and opportunity? Yeah. So, uh, you, you know, when you have a distributed network like ours, um, it, it's very different from a, a data center, um, particularly a, a, a centralized cluster with, with large amounts of memory. You know, um, it, it's a very different architecture from a distributed network of consumer GPUs. Even though these, these GPUs are, are high end and, and you can have reasonable bandwidth, just on the distributed nature, it's kind of a different problem. You know, and, and when we look at AI today, um, it, you know, the majority of AI is delivered centrally for many of the, the reasons being architecture. Um, particularly for training, you know, you've got to load a, a lot of, a lot into memory to, um, process the, the training job as it happens. And, you know, 
today that that's not really well suited towards a, a distributed type framework. Um, that is changing, and you know, federated learning is is a whole area of AI that's that's really interesting. Um, FedML, one of our um, compute clients, has a number of great papers and, and open source technology around it. Um, so I I don't think that necessarily it will be like this forever. But where it stands today, definitely, um, particularly on an LLM uh, with billions of, of parameters, they're, they're probably better suited towards a centralized training stack than a decentralized uh, network. Um, now, now, that being said, what, what's really interesting for us is um, not when we look at just LLMs, but when we look at other models, diffusion models and more, um, the, the diffusion process is actually very similar to the render process. It's a, it's a similar calculation, you know, on the rendering side, we calculate um, light bouncing around and, and come back, you know, with a, a complex output. On the diffusion side, it's, it's somewhat similar. And, and so as we looked at the diffusion models and, and those that create images and, and now 3D assets and video, um, there was a, a little bit more of a um, better fit, um, at least on the inference side, perhaps not on the training side for a, a lot of these models. Um, so that was sort of a first interesting foray into what these these stacks could be used for. Um, I, I think as we look at it more, there are use cases emerging that are not necessarily real time um, that will most likely work very well on um, these decentralized higher latency type network architectures. Um, but all of these use cases are really at their infancy. And for us, um, it, you know, being experts in artist needs and, um, it, you know, we've sort of kept our blinkers on, on that for the render network and, and gone about um, a different approach of a, a B2B approach for AI while we watch these use cases emerge. And, and that B2B approach meant we've, we've selected so far six partners and I'm sure many more will come, um, you know, as, as um, folks want to leverage the compute. Those six partners all have very different ways of orchestrating and of utilizing the network and, and targeting different users. So I'll give you an example. We, we have one that uses Ray, which is a Python library to help cluster and essentially um, dictate jobs across a distributed ecosystem. We have others that just rent out instances. And those those make sense depending on you know, what you're trying to build or do. If you're a Python shop and you use RAID, it would make a lot of sense to, to use, um, you know, a, a RAID cluster that is distributed. Um, it, you know, if you're looking for just a, a cheap one-off instance that you want to control and, and configure, you know, they're, they're different targets. And, um, you know, for us, um, really different uses of the same nodes. And we're really excited as we watch these initial six and future partners progress to, to see which use cases emerge and win for distributed GPUs. Um, I, I really believe just given the market size, given the demand, and given the idle opportunity that's out there, this will come. However, um, the, the primary set of use cases has not yet um, emerged in, in, in a way that scales. Um, so f for us, it, it's a very exciting time because that could change daily. And uh, it's, it's one we track and watch very carefully. And, and I'm sure that that is a lot of a big um, additional opportunity, but even just the rendering is an enormous opportunity. Help, mm -hmm. help us understand, you know, how big you think, like what's the, the blue sky for render over the next two, three, five years? Like, how do you see about, think about revenue, about, you know, scale of, 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 um, of minutes or a video created, et cetera. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, just look at how much is created today already. <laughs> um, and, and then the scary thing that I, I talk about beyond this, and, and I don't like to talk specific revenue numbers, so you can tell I'm, I'm skirting more at, at opportunity, but, um, you know, I, I haven't delved into really the exponential jump between where we are today with 4K and where we're going with 3D. Uh, Apple, Meta, and Samsung all making plays on the 3D um, viewer space. You can see the, the Vision Pro right here behind me. Really our, our first step, we believe, in the internet becoming more 3D. And their limitations, it's not 
great to wear a heavy device around your head all day, but uh, we believe many of these will change over time. Um, you, you know, Otoy has invested in a company called Lightfield Labs that does ambient displays, so you, you don't even need to wear a headset. Um, but a, as we look at 3D content and the consumption of it, we're convinced the internet will transition in that direction over time. And um, the, the jump up in rendering need between where we are today with 4K and where we're going um, is 100 to 1,000 X where we are right now. So, <laughs> you know, uh, what is today a massive, massive part of the internet and the, the first primary use case for the GPU could be 100 to 1,000 X that in the next five years as more and more of the internet becomes 3D and transitions in that direction. It, it truly is, you know, one of, the, for me, the, the fundamental uh, tenets of um, content across the world. Fair enough. And, and, and you mentioned that your pricing, pricing the render network is significantly cheaper. Is that, what does that mean? Is that 30% cheaper, 50% cheaper? Uh, it, it's about a tenth. And, and there's, there's a reason for this, quite simply, a tenth, one tenth, yeah. There's a reason for this, it, it, quite simply, um, it, you know, this is where, the, this is the beauty of the deep end model for me. Um, you, you know, if we were a centralized company who'd raised funding, we'd go out and we'd buy a whole series of, of GPUs, we'd put them in a data center, and we'd have to return that, that cost of capital over a reasonable period of time. Um, by targeting idle, GPUs that, that are already purchased by artists for, for other work. You, you don't have that initial cost of capital to return. In fact, it's the a incremental cost, cost of the artist is yeah. just, yeah, it's just electricity, right? And, and so, um, you, you know, you, you have a significantly different lever in the model. And this is what's so great about Deepin is it, it allows those individuals with that sunk cost to participate in the value of a community uh, in a way that would otherwise have been centralized and, and done in, in you know, more traditional ways. Um, so for, for us, um, the fact that these are idle, the fact that owners can contribute them and participate and be part of the community it is a really, really cool aspect, uh, really part of the, the deep in innovation we love so much. And the, only, and, and the question related to that is in scale. And so it sounds like a limitation to your scale is less on the machines from what you said. It's more about the BD in use. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. And so it's just, yeah. it's just adding more customers because the demand or the supply of GPUs for you from your artist is, you know, multiples it, of where it is right now. So right. it's just the customer, at, at least it's just in, the customer. In, in the midterm. Yeah. In the midterm, we, we've got enough of a wait list that's, that's fantastic. And, and you know, when it comes to the actual usage, um, the, the network has, has been busy. Um, you know, the, many of the proposals that the community voted on last year are coming to fruition now um, in terms of, of other third-party renderers being available on the network. And, and each of those exponentially increase the TAM of artists who can then use this network and, um, you know, first um, create work and second potentially participate in the growth of it, contributing their nodes as it scales and, and as they, um, as we open up the wait list for them. So that they're not only on the, the, the type of job, the, the 3D the, or the 4K to 3D jump, but also on the, um, accessibility from, um, different products and, and different workflows in the ecosystem uh, are, are expanding and, and expected to really show promise as they, um, are released on the network and, and as artists then discover and access them. And I think a lot of that will be combined with things like promotions and referral programs to, to drive people into the ecosystem to realize the, the value of, of the speed and the cost here that can be achieved and, and then grow the network. Super interesting. And, and do you guys disclose or share how many artists are contributing GPUs to the network now? We, we don't. Um, Fair enough. You, you know, you can see on chain um, how many nodes are paid for a given epoch. However, that, that's not necessarily all artists. Um, and, and for us, it, it, it really comes back. Our North Star is the usage. Um, and and yep. so that, that's where I push people. We have a page on the foundation called stats.renderfoundation.com that shows um, yeah, uh, all the history on chain 
around yeah burns and emissions and um, I think is is a great resource for anyone trying to understand um, the scale and the growth of the network. Um, question for you, slightly different topic. You know, you guys, you know, Render is one of the old school projects in the space. What other projects do you like? Do you follow? It sounds like you're you know partnered to some extent with other GPU networks. So those would be mm -hmm. sort of obvious obvious ones. Are there other deep in projects that you yeah. you know think are doing solving interesting problems? There, there's so many, uh, and I, I'm lucky enough to be on a lot of these panels with with folks, where I, I'm seeing real innovation in the cellular area, in Internet of Things, um, you know, um, you know, some really really cool um, ideas. You, you know, as somebody who's who's really dedicated to this project, I, I really don't invest outside it. I, I keep my focus, you know really on this project. So I, I don't uh, really have a, uh, you know, a, an investor type view on these projects. But when I hear the ideas, I, I think a lot of them really make sense. And, uh, you know, for me, that core tenant that, um, you, you know, try and find somewhere where um, you can attack the cost of capital is really, really interesting. Um, and I, I see other uses outside of, of actual physical infrastructure that for me, I, I think will be a next wave of interesting projects. Um, but yes, uh, you, you know, I, I would say Deepin ha has been um, one of the, the real um, emerging uh, segments that has caught everyone's attention just because it, it translates and is so much more understandable to um, somebody who's non-Web3. And uh, yeah, I, I absolutely love a couple of the, the projects, um, you know, that, that we, you know, spend our time talking to and, and talking next to on all these panels. Yeah, I mean, I guess I agree sort of violently with, with that view. And I guess I would say that, you know, Deepin has the potential because it's understandable to onboard the next generation of kind of, you know, interest in the space, if you will. And I think all we're waiting for is a is some real revenue traction. And I think we're very close to that in a variety of projects. You yeah. guys are probably one of them as well, right? But as soon as we can say, here's some real institutional use of XYZ, whether it's you guys, whether it's rent, whether it's helium, whether it's XNet, whether it's whatever, you then, I think that will sort of penny drop moment about how big each of these networks can be. And I know you've, you've reluctant to put numbers out there, but I think the rendering, the rendering, you know, ecosystem is many billions of dollars. And that should, if you guys are able to capture, you know, a material piece of that, or even a, a modest piece of that, that is a super significant amount of um, of tokens to burn, um, which is which is which I find which I find interesting. I'm sure other people do too. Yeah, yeah. I always come back to um, solving the user need. Uh, that's where my mind goes on all this. And um, you know, what's so exciting about this current stage? Is, is with the advent of AI, it, it is disrupting these artists' workflows in a way that uh, we couldn't have even conceived. Um, and, and so I, I think, um, it, you know, the ability to create content is only going to get easier. And um, that's really excited to me because, uh, you know, at the moment, uh, motion graphics artists are, are a, uh, a, a small group of what I think the overall user-generated content could really be. And, and on, yeah, on that basis, I get really, really excited. Fair enough. So your point is that thanks to AI, AI democratizes the ability to create video and motion graphics. And if that happens, Correct. anyone can do it. But guess what? They all need to have it rendered. And if they only have it rendered, someone's got to do Correct. it. And if they're doing it amateur wise, they're super price sensitive. And they're going to be looking for a place like Render to go do that because they're not going to want to mm -hmm. hire some expensive dedicated machine somewhere. Yeah, yeah, it, definitely one real um, scenario as we look out into the future here. And and rendering may well become a combination of AI and rendering too. We're, we're seeing that, uh, those lines blur. Regardless, they'll be using the GPU. And um, you know, we're very hopeful that um, artists will, will come to the render network because that's a, a resource that they trust and um, have used in the past and, and hopefully can solve their needs as their needs evolve. 
Excellent. Well, listen, super interesting. Really love, love the conversation. How do people find Render? How do they follow you, Render? How do they get on the wait list if they're artists that have a GPU that want to sort of be on the wait list? Or, or even more importantly, <laughs> customer that wants to do some rendering and save 90, 90%. Right. So, um, if, you know, uh, two resources, I would say, uh, rendernetwork.com for any artist looking to, uh, to render work. And then on the, um, foundation side, renderfoundation.com, uh, which, which really manages the, um, the protocol. Um, and, and that's everything node related and everything blockchain related. Fantastic. And how do they follow? How do they, how do they find you? Yeah. Um, findable across all mediums, whether Twitter or, or others, um, at drjonessf, Dr. Jones SF. Great. Excellent. Listen, fascinating conversation. Congratulations on all the success and the traction you guys have, have, uh, have created definitely a, uh, a, 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 an example to, you know, all the rest of the deep in projects out there as fluence included. So, um, super interesting to see and, and, you know, look forward to seeing more of the successes going forward. Thanks so much. Uh, great chat.